Evercreech Junction, Somerset. It was to be the Clapham Junction of the West, the place where one line branched away to Bath and collared the Midland trade, and the main line ran to Highbridge and collared the coal from Cardiff. That Pickwickian figure in the frightful hat is, I'm sorry to say, me talking to the station master. But a station master's life, that's something worth living. And you can see why Evercreech Junction wins the prizes for flowers and tidiness. The level crossing gates are worked from the signal box. And here comes the 1232 from Sturminster Newton on her way to Bath, calling at Evercreech Junction, change for Glastonbury, Shatwick and stations to Highbridge. And as we say goodbye to the station master, please notice but on expenses, I'm travelling first. Forget motor cars. Get rid of anxiety. And here, to the rhythm of the Somerset and Dorset Joint Railway. Dream again that ambitious Victorian dream which caused this long railway still to be running through deepest, quietest, flattest, remotest, least spoiled Somerset. This is the line we'll be travelling on. Once it was part of a grand scheme to unite Wales and the South West, and even to stretch to France. The scheme failed, and the main line went along there on the right to Bath and the Midlands. And here's our own bit of line, reduced to a branch, and even that has lost its twigs to wells and bridge water. Great Western was the first friend the Somerset Central ever had, and it's the Somerset Central line we're travelling now. It's rather a relief to be drawn by steam through this uneventful countryside, and just to hear the noises we knew as children. It's the sad road to the sea. West Pennard Station built of the local limestone. And one of the reasons why the Great Western liked this line a century ago was because it was also broad gauge, like the Great Western used to be. Oh, by the way, there's Glastonbury Tor, and how nice to see it without a foreground of villas and petrol stations. In a second or two, you'll find we come to a broad bridge, and as you look through it, you can see how the track was once broad for broad gauge. Glastonbury Station. I suppose the promoters of the Somerset and Dorset hoped that this place was going to become a vast industrial town. As the train, when it stops, waits here for two minutes, I always like to get out and have a look. There's always something to see in a railway station. Let's have a look at the waiting room. Gaslight. Solid furniture. Georgian tradition carried on into Victorian times. I say, I hope you're enjoying this journey as much as I am. You really see much more country once you've got out of the railway station from a train than ever you do from a motor car. 
no hoardings, no road signs, no lorries in front of you, and no neurotics hooting behind you. This is Sedgemoor. Do you remember Hardy's poem, The Tramp Woman's Tragedy? It's written to a sort of railway metre, and it fits here. From Wynyard's Gap, the live long day, the live long day, we beat afoot the northward way, we had travelled times before. The sun blaze burning on our backs, our shoulders sticking to our packs, by fossway fields and turnpike tracks, we skirted sad Sedgemoor. For months we padded side by side, I side by side, through the great forest, black moor wide, and where the parrot ran. We'd faced the gusts on Mendip Ridge, had crossed the yo unhelped by bridge, been stung by every marshwood midge. I and my fancy man. This quiet part of Somerset has got its industries besides farming, cutting withies for basket making, and the railway carries a lot of the peat which is cut on Sedgemoor. The villages are a long way from the station. This is the village of Shapwick, grey limestone. I suppose they hoped there'd be houses all along the road from the village to the station two miles off. And at Eddington and Birtles, they built a railway hotel by the station. I suppose they thought you'd need a rest before the walk to the village. Go away, you brute, you enemy of railways and comfortable travel. You know, I'm not just being nostalgic and sentimental and unpractical about railways. Railways are bound to be used again. They're not a thing of the past and it's heartbreaking to see them left to rot and to see the fine men who serve them all their lives made uncertain about their own futures and about their jobs. What's more, it's wrong in every way when we all of us know that road traffic is becoming increasingly hellish on this overcrowded island and that in ten years from now there'll be three times as much traffic on English roads as there is today. What will the West Country be like then? How will we get anywhere in summer, except by railway? How will we see any country, except from a train? I think it's more than likely that we'll deeply regret the branch lines we've torn up and the lines that we've let to go to rot. I mean, even in America, they're already building new suburban railway lines. Here's Highbridge the end of the passenger line of the Somerset and Dorset. And so, so I suppose I'd better get out. The old Somerset Central Railway, which later became the Somerset and Dorset Joint, started here on its long journey to the English Channel in 1852. And Highbridge is a piece of railway history. It's also a railway contrast. So come and see the older station. There it is, with a diesel hurrying through it to the west, to Bridgewater and Exeter. One of Brunel's original stations, with the broad eaves, 
and the cut stone for the doorways and the windows. But now, cross over the bridge and come and see the slightly younger station, High Bridge of the Somerset and Dorset Joint. You see, High Bridge was the crew of the old Somerset and Dorset. And there is the war memorial to the Somerset and Dorset men who fell in the 1914 war. For this place was the headquarters of the line, and I suppose that's why it is that the seats are rather special cast iron. If you want to see why it's the crew, come and look at the works. There they are. The turntable is still used for turning engines. That's an old Midland engine made in Derby. It used to turn, that turntable, the blue S&D ones. The Midland owned the line when the Somerset and Dorset was given up. And then the Great Western came on. And by the way, what's that? Oh, yes, that's an old push-and-pull branch line GW car, smashed by Ted's from Highbridge. Where did it go from, I wonder? Between Dawlish Warren, Star Cross and Exeter? Between Bourne End and Marlow? Or Castle Bar, Park Holt and Ealing Broadway? Or was it on the Staines branch? Or the Uxbridge branch? And I wonder what city gents planned their holidays as they strap hung and looked at these sepia photographs and wondered where to go. I can't tell you, because this car's now been smashed to bits since I was there. People hate anything well made, you know. It gives them a guilty conscience. This was the carriage works. And here they made the S&D coaches. I can just remember them. And now let's go to the loco works. That little tank engine was made here at Highbridge and given its royal blue livery. This shed is still used for maintenance work. And there's a great western engine. The western region still runs the line. Oh, let's go inside this store if we can get in, yes. I wonder what they kept here. Knee oil for the lamps, coupling rods, or phosphor bronze. Well, it was all part of the family life of a friendly little railway, of men who lived here in Highbridge in these brick terraces, in a faded Swindon, a forgotten crew. I think you ought to see the good side of the line. There's still a lot of goods traffic, and that means the roads are that amount clearer. Thank <laughs> you. 
And if we go on a good strain, we can take a look at Pill, which was once a station and is now a halt, and with no one to look after it. I doubt if there's a quieter, sadder sight in Somerset than Pill, when the train has left and it sinks back to silence. fringe of Sedgemoor from the footplate of a goods train. The line is single track and the driver hands the staff which locks the points and signals to a porter. Now the track behind us is secure. told you that the Great Western and the Somerset Central were friends a century ago when the line we are travelling on was first built. Well, now that we're coming into Highbridge, you can see an extraordinary survival of that long friendship between two railways which were formerly broad gauge. Great Western. There is its main line from Bristol to Exeter. Running through Highbridge Great Western Station and there, right across that important main line, runs the little branch to Highbridge Wharf and Burnham on Sea of the Somerset and Dorset Joint. The line is used for goods only now and we'll follow the goods train through the town of Highbridge to its lonely end. Regardless of roads, and motor traffic, we'll cross the town and come to Highbridge Wharf. There it is, the place the Somerset and Dorset hoped to establish as an enormous port. Here were to be Welsh colliers from Cardiff, and who knows, perhaps, Somerset colliers taking Somerset coal to Wales, the rattle of cranes, the noise of shunting, goods trains puffing with heavy loads of coal for Somerset, Devon and Cornwall. This was to be the barry of the southwest. Up here somewhere, is where the colliers and cargo boats were to unload. The hope was partly realised. 
That's what it's like now. Highbridge Wharf, your hopes have died. They flow like driftwood down the tide, out, out into the open sea, oh sad, forgotten S and D. But let's not be too mournful. There was still another hope of prosperity for this part of the Somerset and Dorset Railway. Excursionists. In 1858, the little line to Burnham was opened, and the station is still there. Huge crowds were expected, and it's worth looking at the station in some detail as an untouched example of early railway architecture. It's got a roof over it like a big terminus. I couldn't get into the waiting rooms and the booking hall because they were locked. But the Southern Railway, which was one of the many companies that operated this line, renamed the place Burnham-on-Sea in a hope to attract railway traffic. The line still runs beyond the station out to meet the sea. There was a pier at the end for steamship passengers crossing the Bristol Channel. Welsh people, after a holiday in Bournemouth, could run merrily back to Wales, and vice versa. Now all that remains is this, and the gradient going down to the sea. The railway bought its own paddle steamer in 1884 and in 1905 the Barry Railway in Wales ran steamer excursions over here to Burnham. All gone, all gone. Transport more than anything changes a place. See how the railway changed Burnham. First the railway hotel then boarding houses of the 1880s, Bristol style, built with railway prosperity, and Victorian hotels on the seafront, and slap up buildings along the seafront of Victorian times. And signs out to attract the motorist of today. Villas for retired folk as permanent residences. In the side roads, houses where goffers lived in the 1920s and bungalows for our own age of the small car. Burnham, with its shining sands, was a Georgian town before the railway came. Let's have a look at it. seaside place. And the air on the sands and on the pier is like wine. Burnham on Sea. The Somerset and Dorset Railway brought you prosperity a century ago. Burnham on Sea, in ten years' time, when the roads are so full of traffic, we'll all be going by train again. You'll be grateful you still have a railway to your town. Don't let Dr. Beeching take it away from you. <laughs> ¶¶